All right, here we are on a special session of Science and Kirk Presents in the Nest, and we bring in Carl Science, and uh, this one is really special to Carl and me, and we've been talking about doing this for three years. <laughs> we have. So finally, I, I I got Carl, I got him down, and uh, he's all healed from COVID. He's perfect. He looks great. And uh, let's get rolling here. And we're going to talk about the Duke Maryland rivalry. One of the great, in my eyes, one of the great rivalries, even though Duke never admitted it, but uh, that it was a rivalry. But in Maryland, it was. And also, we're going to go a little bit of the history of Science at Kirk. So let's open up with a Maryland guy, myself, a Duke guy, and Carl. A Duke guy also likes well, Maryland a lot. So. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. Let, 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 me, let me comment go on ahead. that, first of all. Two, two comments from what you've already said. <laughs> Number one, I have dual citizenship, okay? Okay. I, I grew up at Coldfield House. I was going to the games with... Greg Manning, Albert King, Buck Williams, Taylor Baldwin, okay, Dutch Morley. I mean, you know, so I grew up a Maryland fan. I mean, that was that was my and and being an ACC basketball fan, frankly, is what led me to go to Duke. You know, I had a few schools to choose from, and I was like, well, shoot, I'm going to Duke so I can see some ACC basketball. Correct. You know, um, so there's that. And number two, Duke knew that was a rivalry, and and Bruce, you know it better than anybody because of how Coach K responded to you that one famous interview that you did. Uh, he was not, a, he, did not, he did not like me too much. All right. He didn't know me well, but he did not like my presence there. Uh, no, that's I, how you, and, and look, and the, way they re, the way that he reacted to Maryland leaving the conference, you know that that Maryland cut deep with him. And I believe that. He, believe me, he knew that was a rivalry. Yeah, you <laughs> know, when Maryland left, I don't think there were more anybody more upset than coach K because he knew right. when Maryland left, the conference was going to change the standard, the high standard of this conference academically and every other way. Uh, when you started to add all these teams that are not ACC teams, never will be Syracuse, uh, Virginia tech and uh, Louisville and it just isn't the same, but that's another story. Well, and for also, another day. I, I think I think he liked recruiting in the Maryland area as well. You know, Grant Hill, you know, yeah, primarily that, among them. Yeah, you know? no, I, I agree. I agree. But let's start off with the fact that numbers wise, why this was this really a deep rivalry, and I'll tell you why. I looked it up yesterday, and uh, out of the 177 games that Duke and Maryland played over the years, not just Coach K and Williams. It was 114 to 63 Duke. All right. Now, that's uh, less than two to one. But when Coach K came around, he turned out to be 41 and 14 against Gary Williams. So, didn't Gary feel, didn't, didn't, didn't feel that way. It didn't feel ahead. that way. And I'll tell you why it didn't feel that way. Because he won the first 14. So when Coach K was beyond those 14, it's when Duke was in prominence and Maryland was coming. Okay. Coming big time. Yep. Uh, you know, after Gary first started there. At that point, it became, after own 14, you become 14 and 27. Now, that doesn't sound like a good record. But against Duke, it was a hell of a record. Only yeah. Carolina was better. Maryland was 14. And, I mean, you look at, like, Clemson, like, 2 and 90. And, the, you know, it was insane. So Correct. many teams rarely ever beat Duke. You think about you think about Wake Forest beating Duke. How many times did it happen? Florida State might have had a little bit more success. But nobody uh, gave Duke that run that Maryland did. And now, talk to me about your time in Duke and from, you know, because I sure talk about Maryland enough. Talk about your well, time in Duke I, I, and, the, and, and, and the situation when Maryland came there in your years that you were there. So, so my years at Duke were, were 85 to 89. And um, so this, so Duke was an underdog at that point. Coach K wasn't Coach K yet. 
Coach K was just off the hot seat when I got down to do. Um, the seniors that year, my first year, were, were Dawkins, Phyllis, Allery. Uh, they went to the Final Four. They lost to Louisville in the finals. That, season. that was the Never turning nervous. point, though. Purvis. That was the turning that point. That was the turning point. That's <laughs> correct. But, but remember, he was in the triangle. with he hit, and, and I was in a group called Bog. It was a, it was a non-Greek fraternity. It was a living group, you know. And Bog's thing was basketball. We, we sat behind the visiting bench. And Coach K loved us, frankly. Um, you know, the, 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 the tenting, the, Krzyzewskiville started in my freshman year. But um, Coach K would come to barbecues, pig pickings with North Carolina. He'd come to, our, to pig pickings at Bog at least once, sometimes twice a year, at least once a year with the team. And his family, his kids would come and hang out with us. And he was incredibly open and honest. He wouldn't do it, I'm sure now in a day of cell phones and the internet and all that, he wouldn't have been that way. But back then, it was, he was. And he let us know how he felt about Dean Smith and how he felt about Jim Valvano. Both those guys had won national championships since he came to Duke in the 82 or when he, 81 or 82, whenever he came to or 80, whenever it was that he came to Duke. And he was really on the hot seat because you've got two guys down the road, you know, Carolina's eight miles away that had won the title already. So he was an underdog at that point. And he would tell us how he felt. He didn't like those guys. He turned out to have wonderful relationships with both of them in the end. But at that point, it was really, they were going at it. My freshman year, I was still rooting for Maryland. And Len Bias came in. It was his last, it was his final year at, at, at Maryland. And my first year at Duke. And he comes in and I was quietly rooting for Maryland. Lenny scored 41 points. I believe it's still the record for a visiting player at Cameron. Um, and he was just, he was Len Bias. He was, he was Michael Jordan. I mean, he was the man. That was his he final was, year at Maryland, correct? It was, yes. And, and then a month later, he goes down to Chapel Hill. Carolina's number one. It was their first year at the Dean Dome. And Lenny, that's, of course, the famous sequence, the jump shot, steals the inbound. Reverse dunk. Reverse dunk. dunk. And, he beat, he, and Carolina had been number one. They lost to Maryland that night. And but Lefty was, Lefty was still there, right? Yes, he was. That was Lefty. Correct. Right. And, oh, man, the Duke fans loved Lefty. He was a Duke graduate. Right. Lefty Drysdale. And he, he used to he used to he used to be like a he used to play that, you know, I'm just a old country, you know, coach, you know, kind of thing. But he was a dookie. But um, man, but then boy did that rivalry get intense. I mean, it just got intense to the point where when I was out of college and would take my kids to to to, to the Duke Maryland games at Maryland, it was a little nasty. It was more I, I than a little to, nasty. Yeah. It was and, more and that's, than I think, that's what got under Coach K skin more than anything. But um, you, you know who his favorite player of all time is? I, I mean, non-Duke. His favorite non-Duke player of all time. Guess who it is? Juan Dixon. Exactly right. He loved, and who didn't? He yeah. loved Juan Dixon. He respected him. He respected Gary Williams. Because one thing he knew when Duke played Maryland is you were going to get Maryland's best effort. Even when they weren't that good, they'd come down and just, you know, they won some games in Cameron. They won, they should, you wouldn't have expected them to win. And it, that was my favorite rivalry. I, it was hard because I, I ended up rooting really for both teams, even during the same game. It was really. You can't, you can't. Really, yeah. I, I, Listen. It was, I, I, I did not enjoy them playing. I hated when they played in the final four. You can only have you can only have one wife. Okay. You can I know. I hear wives, you. So. I hear you. But your heart's still deeper for Duke, I believe. It much is deep, it much is. deeper. I, I it is. I agree. All right. Let's let me ask you a couple questions. Uh first I'll preface it with my my thoughts. Uh my two biggest wins over Duke. All right. And it, it might surprise you a little bit when I say this. The two biggest wins, number one, 
was when, uh, in 1984, when Maryland yeah. Oh, yeah. In, in, in the ACC championship, just after years of getting pummeled by Duke, all right, they finally were able to put it together, all right? And you were talking about Bias and Ben Coleman, Keith Gatlin, yeah. and that was their first ACC title that was under lefty, 74-62. But the game that I remember that to me was the most bitterly won game, and I know of Duke people who went nuts over it, was when Maryland ruined Shane Battier's senior night. (laughs) Yeah. I've been there for senior night, and it is a special night at Duke. It really is. People who haven't been to Cameron don't realize how intimate it is and how small it is. And if you're in. The last row, all right, of Cameron, you're closer to the court than 95% of the ACC arenas. I mean, right. it would be, at Maryland, it would be a $100,000 seat you'd have to buy to get, to donate to get that seat. That, that's how small it is. What's old, 8,700 right. or something to that effect? It's about 9,000, and they squeeze so them in. When the game was over, after the game's over on senior night, the seniors come out and talk to the crowd. All right. I, I was there and they had lost. And Battier, uh, I'm not sure if they didn't win the title that year, but Battier was just shook. And if you ever asked him, I never met him, talked to him, but if I ever did, and you said, What was your most painful loss? I bet it was senior be. night. So I, I, I guarantee you're right. I throw it back to you. All right. And you tell me your two most favorite wins of Duke over Maryland. And I, I've well, got more. You I can mean, guess them. You right, can guess go them. ahead. I mean, you, you know, the, the, the final minute up at the Maryland. The minute miracle, they, they call it. The, the, minute, the minute miracle. I mean, right? that, the, that night before the, the night before the Super Bowl against the yes, Giants. Yes, it was. Exactly. Before the Ravens won. Exactly right. And uh, I, I remember um, my, my wife was out of town visiting her friend in Florida. So I'm taking care of both kids, right? I, and they're toddlers. And I'm and I, so I've got my eye on the game, but I'm also taking care of the kids. And I'm like, oh, you know, well, we lost this one. But, you know, I'm happy because, you know, it's Maryland. If we had to lose, if Duke has to lose, at least it's to Maryland. So and I'm just keeping my eye on it. I'm like, well, uh, and I'm watching it. I'm like, I can't believe what I'm seeing. That, hey, was, that was Jason. It was Jay, it was Jay Williams was on that team, right? Fatty A. Um, and that was a gut punch to Maryland. But that was also the year with my second favorite. I think it was the same year, the Final Four in Minnesota, right? Right. Is that, is that where that's – Maryland went Maryland... down. Maryland went down and beat Duke down there, all right? Correct. And, yeah. then, and then I think they either lost to NC State or Duke in the, in the ACC tournament – but I remember after the game, all the guys were talking to each other, said, we know we're going to see you again. You know what I mean? Yep. Duke said, yes. this is, you know, Duke uh, Batty said, you might have lost, but you know we're going to hit each other again. And they did well, in Minnesota. Yeah. And, and it was that, that's when, that was when they were down 17. Right, 22. Duke was down 17. 22. 22. In the first half. Yeah. Barely got off. I happened to be sitting with Kevin McHale that day. All right. You froze up on me. Yeah. Can you hear me at least? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I happened to be sitting next to Kevin McHale. All right. Not because yeah. I was anybody special. It's just where my seat was. He comes over and he's sitting down next to me. And we're watching the game. And he made a comment. And I'm asking him all kinds of questions. And he was a great guy. And I said, I said, Kevin, when Maryland was up, I think they were up 26 to 4 or 26 to 6. Yeah, it was he said, I've never seen a team yeah. more prepared than Maryland was for this game. And unfortunately, sometimes when those kind of games happen, you know Maryland's not going to win by 40. Duke slowly came back. They cut it to, I think, 10 at halftime. And you had a, a pit in your stomach. And then they did something that I talked to Steve Blake about. They called Steve Blake twice for carrying the ball. And it was the way he dribbled 
that looked like it could be a carry. He never got called for it before or after. But two times they called him for carrying. And then the end of the game, there was that horrendous call against Lonnie Baxter. All right. When and uh, when he was uh, somebody was backing in and he had his arm around him and they fouled him out of the game. And, and Coach Williams went apoplectic, started screaming at the timekeeper and everybody. And when it was all over, Duke won that game. They beat Arizona. And Maryland knew the two best teams in the country. So did Duke. The two best teams in the country were Maryland and Duke. And that was their championship. Most people couldn't even remember who they beat in the championship. All right? Correct. It was beating and that was, Maryland. that was also the game. Speaking of Battier, Battier had four fouls for most of that second half in the Final Four. And they must have let him get away with maybe three or four plays. Whatever. It, looked like the fifth, it looked like the fifth foul. You and I both know that that loss propelled Maryland to win the national title in the next year. It, it did. So there was something about it that, oh, it was bad, but, you know, something good came out of it in my eyes. Because Gary said, we're going to win the title next year. Nobody says things like that. And uh, no, th- th- those, th- those, those years, those two teams made themselves better because of that rivalry. Kind of like the Steelers and the Ravens. You know, the Steelers. 100% right. Both teams brought out the best in each other. And yeah, Duke won two out of three, but they didn't win four out of five. And there's a big difference. Maryland won its shares of game down in Cameron. And Duke had yeah. some humiliated Maryland a few times in College Park, which is probably when your kids were accosted, you know. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, there were some games where Duke just got on top and ran away. But uh, let's transpose a little, little bit. And, and the other main, main reason we, we're doing this show is to talk about Science and Kirk. You've been su- such a great friend to me and sponsored me for years and sponsored this show now on, uh, on WNST. And let's talk about of the history of science at Kirk because, you know, is you know in a f- five minute summary, I know it because your dad has told me. Your dad obviously is one of the top lawyers ever in this state, but more than that, he's a man of wisdom. I, I know I've had other lawyers tell me that they call they would call Donald for advice when they were up against the wall in a, you know, in a legal jackpot. I didn't know how to handle a case. Didn't know what to do, and he was he. He's been like, like the dawn of lawyers. Yeah, and I agree. Must that right, you know. And there's never, yeah, that's, there's never a lawyer true. person that he would he would turn down giving advice to. And uh, uh, tell us about, about his roots becoming the legend that he is in the in the legal business. I'd love to. I would love to. So so dad, um, Donald, my dad. So his his father had passed away when he was 16. And, and so dad sort of um, helped run the family uh, real estate business at that point. They owned, they owned a bunch of houses and he'd collect the rent from the, they called him, he was called the rent boy, but um, he did that through high school and then went to UB university of Baltimore at night and continued being the rent boy during the day. And uh, when he graduated college, he started teaching um, elementary school as a teacher, and he went to law school at night at UB as well. University this was a normal path for people becoming lawyers back then. You wouldn't hear about that today too much about what he went through to become a lawyer. But back then, this was not not you know natural. So many lawyers, you know, became lawyers that you would be went to you would be there went to you would be law school. Very very right. uh, very very common thing back then. No question. So he gets out and he starts his own practice. And, you know, he's, he's, he starts it out of the home, out of our house when I, was a kid, when I was a little kid. And he'd go meet clients at Dunkin' Donuts, at the public library, at McDonald's, you know, because he, he didn't have, he couldn't afford to have an office downtown. So that's how he started. He, uh, he, he meets this one client in Baltimore and that client had a cousin down on the Eastern Shore and who needed some help. And I guess a light bulb went off in my dad's head. And he goes down to the Eastern shore and realizes, boy, there's really, there is nothing available to these folks 
in the legal services, there's nothing. I mean, if you didn't have money, you were not talking to a lawyer back then. There were no free consultations at that point. I mean, basically, people that had lawyers were in country clubs, you know. Um, he goes down to the Eastern Shore and realizes there's a whole population, mostly black people, that didn't have access to lawyers. And he, he gets his little second story, little office above some bakery or something down in Pocomoke on the Eastern Shore. And he started going down there once a week. And after about a month or so, he comes down and there's a line out the door because he's giving free legal advice and, you know, signing up clients when appropriate. But he also was, was, was happy and willing to meet with anybody that had a question and try to provide some guidance or some help. And, uh, and that, was not, that was not done. That, nowadays, they, they, they call that uh, disrupting. You know, he was a disruptor before they were called disruptors. And he, he had, listen, he wasn't popular. I mean, he literally had threats made against him by, the, by KKK people. He had a couple strikes against him, right? He was from Baltimore, so he's coming over the bridge, which they didn't care for down the Eastern Shore very much. And, and he was Jewish. And, and he was helping black people. So between those three things, he had some people that didn't like him very much and let it be known that they didn't like him very much. But, uh, but dad, you know, that's, he believed in what he was doing and he believed that people had the right to have representation and to pursue uh, a claim if they've been wronged and he, he lived it and breathed it and he meant it and and he just built up a practice from his bootstraps based on that he'd go down to pokemo once a week for years and he, he, he'd come home it was typically fridays and he'd come home like around eight or nine o'clock at night you know and that was just how it was how did it grow uh, from there how did it grow from there, Carl? I know that uh, you, know, so, you know from that point to becoming a mega national lawyer is not an easy trip. Yeah, so he so he meets Harvey Kirk and they and they 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 join up together and it's, they started Science and Kirk about in 1973. Then about three years later, there was a decision out of out of an Arizona case made by the Supreme Court, which for the first time said that it was legal for lawyers to advertise before then lawyers could not advertise um he saw that decision and within a few literally within a few weeks he was up on the air um he's one of the first handful of lawyers in america that started advertising um he uh, he brainstormed a little bit and actually came up with his own campaign and the if you have a phone, you have a lawyer. He start, He came up with that early on, and stuck with it. It's one of the one of the, honestly. I mean, it's one of the longest living and successful branding campaigns. I don't care what industry you're talking about. I mean, this you have a lawyer. If you have a phone, you have a lawyer. It's become so ubiquitous in the Mid Atlantic, you know, and, and it's it. it I mean, even if he had just retired based on, on his marketing skill, he would have been renowned. You know, you know? it's funny. I, I, I'm i sure that TV stations or radio stations and people like myself all, all over the country worship Science and Kirk because of the amount of advertising revenue that they, they have. But That's your dad true. told me yeah. one thing one time, and he said, he said, you, you know, a lot of guys, Guys come around and they'll try and hit the market hard. And he said, when they do that, I double my, my advertising. Yeah, he did do nobody that. Is ever gonna, yep. no, nobody is, is ever going to outspend me. And you, with you and your brothers and uh, the Kirk family, uh, been, and you guys have made that, that commitment because you know it works. But, you know, whether it's billboards or the radio or television or whatever, uh, you guys have controlled, but the, the other thing you've done is the, your theory of being straightforward. And I, I know this from uh, people who I've sent to you who've gone to work for you, that every one of them raves about the culture at Science and Kirk. 
it never wavers. Honesty, fairness, you know, attention, it, it permeates the entire business. And, and there's no accident to success. There's no, no shortcut to success. And uh, your father, you know, so many, you know, you know that I'm friends with a lot, a lot of big time lawyers in, in Baltimore and Maryland. And to this day, all right, to this, this day, even when your dad has gotten up in the years, all right, and doesn't practice much anymore. I'm telling you, as recent as like uh, six or seven months ago, somebody said they called Donald about something, you know? Yes, I know. To this day, all I right? know. And, uh, no, I mean, dad, dad, dad had clients who's were generational, right? I mean, their, their, their sons and daughters would come to us for services, you know, for, for legal needs. I mean, no, you're and our employees. I mean, you know, we, we have staff here that we've had people that have been here over 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, 15 years. I mean, that we've got plaques on the wall. They, they get, we, we, everybody gets a plaque when you've been each, you know, 10 year, 15, 20, 25, you get a plaque and, and we're proud of that. And that's, you know, it translates, it translates to the clients, you know, um, you know, I mean, we, we really did help pioneer this idea of, of free legal advice, right? Where you don't have to pay to speak to a lawyer. If you have a phone, you have a lawyer, give us a call. We're going to talk to you. Um, and I'm going to tell you, we're going to, we're going to all going to tell you if I don't know the answer, then I'm going to direct you where to go for the answer. We're not going to just say, oh, you know, you, I'm not making any money off of you and hang up on you, you know, right? Um, which is a lot, of, a lot of people get that experience when they call a law firm, you know, um, we, we don't act that way. Um, one thing about dad, and, and this is a lesson for any business that you're in, is he always liked to tell me that he, he would know what he didn't know. And, and when he know he didn't know something, he'd go get the answer. He'd ask somebody that he thought was more knowledgeable than him. Best example of that is in the early 90s, I was a young lawyer. My dad and I went down to Florida, like Orlando, for some Yellow Pages event where they invited all the lawyers that advertised on the back of the book yellow pages book you know which was the thing back then and and we're down there and i'm, I'm looking around the room and and dad was in his mid-50s at that point and i was in my early 30s and my dad was probably, probably the second youngest person in that room besides me you know and i was telling dad i was like dad you know this is kind of the old this is old this is old this is going out of style this yellow pages thing and he's like, what do you mean He's like, everybody goes to the internet. I was, that's why I said, he's like, what, he's like, what's the internet? What does that mean? I did my best to explain it to him. I mean, I wasn't all that proficient with it either. I, I, had, I had children before I had an email address, you know? So, but he was like, how do people get electricians or plumbers? They go to the yellow pages. I said, not anymore, dad. They, they go to the computer. They go to the internet. So we get back to Baltimore and his Harvey Kirk, dad's partner, my partner too, but, but his son, Austin, also a partner at the firm was the youngest of the second generation. Right. And, and, and who and I understand most, is super brilliant, by the way. Oh, he's, Austin he is, he's a, he is, he's a genius, honestly. Um, detail oriented beyond belief. Okay. But, um, we knew that he understood what the internet was. So dad calls him into his office and says, I don't care what your dad thinks, you know, and I'll tell him so. I don't care what he thinks. He said it a little bit more colorfully than that. But he said, I want you to go home, Austin. And I don't want to see you again. I want you to go home and figure out this internet thing and get us on the internet. And that sort of led to our second itineration of, of Science and Kirk. You know, we've maintained ourselves as a local practice in the Mid-Atlantic for auto accidents and medical malpractice claims. Uh, but we've also expanded to do national work on, on mass torts um, and medical malpractice claims around the country. And, and we're on the internet, you know, for that. And, and, that, and that's because dad was willing to listen that he always said his favorite, his favorite singer was Bob Dylan. And he always used to, he told me this since I was a kid. He said his favorite line from a Bob Dylan song was, uh, they not busy being born or busy dying. You know, you've always got to renew yourself. You've always got to be looking 
ahead and looking around and be willing to change and be willing to learn new things. That's what it's been about. And, and that's why we're in business now going on 50 years because of those lessons, you know, that he, that he, that he really did believe in and teach. And then of course, just his commitment to the clients. So get to the point about how I, how I really got to know your dad so well. I had season tickets to the Colt games when I was seven and eight years old and my brothers had no interest in taking me. All right. <laughs> but my brother says, you know, I got one friend, really a good guy. He'll take you every week. And that's how Donald science got tickets and went to the Colt game. And he used right. to bring me, he'd come with the bags of food and, you know, <laughs> he had everything. He made it a great day. And I would say, Three or four years, we went to every Colt game. and uh, amazing. And they were, it's amazing. And they I were strong it. years. You're talking about like 59, 60, yeah. 61. Uh, and it was Donald and me picked me up every Sunday because every game was at 2 o'clock, if you remember. Yep. There was yep. no Monday night games or anything. And uh, that's how I got to know him and, and stayed friendly with him over the years with nothing to do about law, just about, you know, sports, you know, and your dad's yep. super guy. Carl, let's segue back to uh, Duke and Maryland. How sad is it that since 2014, Duke and Maryland have not played? It's been you know, I, It is. I, I wish, I wish coach K had gotten over it, honestly, because <laughs> Man, they, they, it would be good for Duke, frankly, to, to be to keep up with Maryland. Just, I mean, obviously they can recruit wherever they want to recruit. But I mean, I, it's it's a shame because that was a fun rivalry. It was a really bitter rivalry. That's what you want. That's what you when, want. That makes it makes sports great. Well, you know, obviously I've been covering Maryland for a long time, and I have to tell you one thing: that when he came to Maryland and won. And it wasn't, it was probably 50% of the time. It wasn't uh, dominant. I mean, you know, he had his share of wins. But, and you saw him after the game, and all the Dukies sit behind the bench were with him. This was a happy man. And I don't care if Maryland was number two or number 82. And I don't care if it was reverse, which it probably never was. But when he came to Maryland and won, he was at the peak of happiness. More so than when Maryland would go down there and Duke would squash us, okay? It was another day at the office. But when he came to Xfinity Center, all right, and they won, it was special for Duke. And when Maryland won their few games down there, all right? Uh, and, and, and that's because, one of the reasons, because the Xfinity Center, when Duke came to town, or other, any ACC game back in, in the Gary Williams days, that was a hard place to play for a visiting team it's believe it or not with COVID withstanding it still is it hasn't really changed it, yep, absolutely long. no no doubt Turgeon used to say to me that every time he walked on the court at Maryland at Maryland he didn't never expected to lose and his home record was unbelievable but uh even but that, today but that, but, th but that home crowd advantage was kicked up a huge notch when, when Duke, Duke in came Dallas. in for whatever reason it was the most vicious crowd that I've ever seen. Now I've never, I've been to Oakland, but never in their heyday. And I hear that they, you know, the, the crazies there with the uh, motorcycles and the horns coming out. You know, <laughs> I hear that's pretty rough. And Philly's a tough town. Phillies are just, but they're tough on their own Correct. team. You know what I mean? Correct. Philly's yes. the toughest. But when Duke came to Maryland, it was just something. It didn't matter what it was. Something got in your system about how insane that game was. And true. Uh, I miss it. Everybody, I don't miss one thing about the ACC. Not one thing. I always thought Maryland was treated like a stepchild. Right. But I'll be honest with you. I miss the Duke games. There's no doubt about it. Because uh, Maryland will never have an opponent to parallel <coughs> that feeling. The I agree. Have, They'll have opponents where they'll get battles, like it was starting with Michigan and between yep. Turgeon and Jawan Howard. That's gone. Guys don't last anymore. You, you, right. 
Coaches aren't that's, there forever anymore. Once, listen, whoever replaces Coach K, Shire, right? Yep. What are the odds he lasts more than eight or ten years? All right? They're very That'd be a strong. good run. That'd be a listen, good run if he did that. Yeah. You can ask Mark Turgeon. You never want to be the guy who replaces a legend. All right? Yeah, no you want to be the guy who replaces the guy who replaced the legend. And right. – uh Duke's going to have some losing Coach K. He's worth seven points when he walks on the court. There's no doubt. I agree. The respect from the uh, refs, the respect from the other teams. He's worth a lot. To beat Duke today, I watched Miami the other day when they beat Duke. I don't know if you watched the game. Florida State. Florida <laughs> State. With, uh, Florida State. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. What they had to do to win that game was a near miracle. All right. They played out of their minds. Yeah, I mean, the shots they mind. had to make, the things they had I to know. do. Yep. And that kid, Banchero, is just off the charts. He's in another yeah. world. He doesn't belong in yep. college. But uh, I don't know. Carl, it's been a great session here. And uh, again, once again, I, I can't help but thank uh, you and the Kirk family for supporting me all these years as you continue to do. But uh it's been an honor, an honor. I go back to your dad and my, all my thoughts are to him. And uh, I hope the rest of his life is peaceful without pain. Absolutely. All right. Being taken yes, care of. And, and from what yes. I understand, it is. And that's, that's what, right. And your mom, too, because she's certainly part and, of it. And they're still enjoying the games. I can tell you that. I know that. There's no doubt. So thanks for coming on. This will be up. Uh, You'll hear it on WNST. It'll be on YouTube, and it'll be all over uh, with my recording faux pas. I'm going to need a little work to get it done, but we'll get it done. Carl, thanks so much. It was great. Thank you, Bruce. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. All right.